When we watch the news, we always see the same thing. Robberies, bombings, murders. These things we see out there are terrifying, but at the same time, we always feel alienated. As if those things are far away and only happening to people on TV. I used to think that. I didn't think that something as terrible as what happened to me and my family could happen to us. And with what I lived through, I'm surprised I'm here to tell you about it. That tragic day was a Friday in the fall in Canada. It was October, one of those days where the leaves fall slowly and everything seems to stand still in time. My parents, my brother Tim and I were in our car, an old pickup truck that we had rented to travel the famous Route 16. We didn't know at the time that it was also known as the Highway of Tears. The plan was simple, a family vacation, pictures, and hiking the trails. To be honest, I preferred to be at home with my friends, but I wasn't upset either. I was still going to have a good time. That afternoon, around 4 o'clock, we stopped at a small clearing by a river. My parents wanted to take a break before continuing the trip. We had covered a lot of miles, and the sun was beginning to set behind the mountains. While my father unloaded the backpacks, Tim and I ran to the riverbank. Tim was only nine years old. He was visibly more excited than I, who had just turned 17. My mom was inside the car, looking for something in her purse. I bent down to pick up a smooth stone and threw a few into the river. That's when a man appeared down the trail, just at the edge of the clearing. We hadn't seen him arrive. He was wearing a dark brown jacket and jeans. He looked like a local. My father greeted him with a friendly gesture, as he used to do with everyone. The man asked us if we needed help, as if we were the lost ones. My father replied that we were fine, that we were just making a short stop. The man stood there for a few seconds before disappearing into the trees. We stayed in that clearing a while longer until the light began to fade. Dad called us back to the car. Tim didn't want to leave, but Mom insisted. I wanted to leave, too. I was always somewhat paranoid, and the encounter with that man was extremely strange. I was uncomfortable from then on, and I was very glad when we finally left. We got into the car, and Dad started, but we didn't get very far before a loud noise shook the van. The car lurched. One tire was flat. Dad got out of the car to check the tire, and as he did, we heard footsteps in the dry grass again. I looked up and saw two other men coming out of the woods. Neither of them smiled. That's when the third appeared behind my father. I don't know how we didn't hear him approach. The men caught my father off guard, and I was the first to realize what was about to happen. I was the only one who saw the man's hand pulling a knife out of his pants. I don't know how I reacted. It all happened so fast that it took my brain a while to process what was happening. I saw my father fall to the ground with a hole in his neck. He quickly covered the wound to stop bleeding, but it was useless. He died almost instantly. My mother screamed, running towards him, but the men intercepted her. Tim and I were trapped in the car. All I could hear was the sound of banging and a mom's increasingly desperate screams. One of the men yanked open the back door. He pulled my arm hard, and for a moment, I thought he was going to break me. Tim was screaming, crying, begging mom to help us, but no one could do anything for us. I was thrown to the ground with such violence that I ran out of air. I heard Tim crying, begging to be left alone. I watched as they dragged him out of the car, dragging him like an animal. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. I was frozen, and that's when I saw them raise their knives again. The last image I have of my brother is his small figure being dragged into the trees. It was then I knew I would never see him again. One of the men walked towards me. I started to back away slowly. I knew I could do nothing. I knew I was going to die. But without realizing it, I had an accident that saved my life. I didn't realize it at the time, but behind me, the road was steep and going downhill. I began to fall quickly, hurting my whole body with small stones and logs. I don't know how long I was on the ground, but when I opened my eyes, I was alone. I looked up, and there they were. The three men were watching me from above. They were not in a hurry. They were looking at me seriously as if analyzing me. At that moment, I felt horrible. I no longer felt like a victim of a crime. I felt like an animal that was about to be hunted, pointing at me as if it was a sign that the hunt had begun. I knew I couldn't just stand there. I turned and ran. I ran like I had never run before in my life, 
I didn't care about the pain, which by the way was a lot. I couldn't hear anything except my heartbeat and the branches breaking under my feet. I started to hear noises around me. They were catching up to me. I knew I was not fast, but I was desperate. At that moment, I understood one thing. If they weren't in such a hurry to follow me, it was because they knew the forest. Was I going deeper into the forest? Sooner or later, they would find me. I couldn't keep running. I stayed in my position and hid in the hole of a hollow log. I was alone, all alone, and they were out there, looking for me. I felt this was a bad idea. They would surely not take long to find me. Minutes passed, maybe hours, I don't know. The sound of their footsteps had disappeared, but after a while, it came back. They were looking for me. They knew I was hiding, but they also knew I was trapped and that there was nothing I could do. My only option was to wait. I heard a branch snapping just outside by the trunk. It was the tallest man, his shoes full of my father's blood. I stood still, praying he wouldn't bend down. I watched him approach a little at a time. I felt like I was dying. I couldn't stop shaking. But then, something distracted him. He heard a distant sound and came out again. I took that moment to run away again. The man was looking around. Nothing told me he would come back once he finished inspecting that sound. I ran again. I no longer cared about starving to death or getting into the heart of the forest. I didn't have much time left. I couldn't hide anymore. I kept running. My feet were bleeding, but I didn't stop. I didn't know if I was still being followed, but I couldn't risk it. Finally, I started to get very tired. Everything was blurry. I couldn't take another step, but I still forced myself to run. Everything started to cost me twice as much. I was so dizzy, I couldn't feel my body anymore. From one second to the next, I became very sleepy and my body stopped responding. I fell to the ground. I had fainted. I was found by hunters the next day. They told me they found me miles from where I had started. I was dirty, with wounds on my feet and face, dehydrated, but alive. My parents and Tim were not so lucky. The police never caught the men who did it. They say they might have been part of a criminal gang operating in that area, but there was never any proof of who might have done it. I was one of the only survivors of the Highway of Tears, which is still claiming victims today. After that, I ended up living with my aunt and cousins. They never found the criminals. They don't even know if they are the same ones who killed other people. It could be just the three of them. It could be more than 10 or 20 people. The only thing I know is that I am alive by miracle. After going to a psychologist for a long time, I was able to face what happened that afternoon. But you know what I still can't and won't be able to erase? My father's lifeless face, my mother's screams, and my little brother's eyes as he was taken to the trees to be stabbed and murdered. This story is based on the tragic events along the Highway of Tears, a stretch of highway in British Columbia, Canada, where numerous people, specifically women, have gone missing or been found murdered since the 1970s. This desolate route known as Highway 16 runs through remote and isolated areas, making it a dangerous place for those forced to travel by foot or hitchhike. Many of the victims were indigenous women and others were tourists just passing by. Fall had always been my favorite season. I don't want to sound old fashioned, but there's something about the falling leaves and the perfect temperature that I've always loved. In the summer, it's hot. In the winter, it's cold. And in the spring, too hot for my taste. Admittedly, having a house in the woods helped me love fall so much. Every year, my family and I would take long walks in the woods surrounding our house. This year was to be no exception. Nothing indicated that fall was going to end the way it did. It just happened. It all started with a walk. Nothing more normal than that. We walked along the path we already knew. We had walked it hundreds of times. Everything seemed normal until we noticed the old woman. At first, we didn't think anything too strange, just an old woman walking a few meters away from us. She seemed lost. My children looked at her curiously, and my wife suggested that maybe we should help her. Surely her family was looking for her. I decided to approach the old woman to see if she needed help. I told my wife to go on with the children and that I would catch up with them in a moment. I thought maybe she needed guidance or that she had lost her way. I approached her with a smile and asked her if everything was okay. But what happened next was the beginning of the end. The old woman stopped dead in her tracks when I was a few steps away from her. She didn't answer me right away, 
She just stood there watching me. It was then that she smiled. It was not a friendly smile, not a smile that inspired confidence. It was a weird grimace like she was about to do something bad to me. It's very rare to explain. Definitely one of those things that you have to be there to feel it. But at that moment, I felt fear. I know it doesn't make sense that she was just a lost old woman, but something in that person's eyes terrified me. Without saying a word, the old woman began to laugh <laughs> softly. Her trembling hand went to her jacket and, with a slow, deliberate movement, she opened it. Inside her jacket, hanging by several threads, I saw what appeared to be the heads of several dead birds. The smell emanating from inside was nauseating. A mixture of rot and death that made me instinctively recoil. The old woman was laughing more and more, and I was completely confused. Scared and confused. Not knowing what to do, I slowly backed away, trying not to lose my composure. I didn't want my children to see what I had just witnessed. I didn't want my wife to be alarmed. I walked away from the old woman and walked quickly towards them. When I saw them, we kept walking, not saying a word about the old woman. My wife noticed my tense expression, but I decided to lie to her, saying that the old woman had only been talking gibberish and that everything was fine. We left the place quickly, and I thought I would never see the lady again. I was wrong. I started to see that old lady much more often. At first, it was a casual encounter. I would meet her walking near my work. I would see her as I passed by my house or when I was riding my bike. She was just standing on the road watching me as if she knew I was about to pass by. It was true that I had a very routine life, but would an old lady learn my routine perfectly well? I put that idea out of my mind, telling myself that it made no sense. I got even more worried when my children also started to notice something strange. They also saw her walking near the house or the school, but I didn't know how to explain to them what was going on. I told them that she was just an older woman who was probably a little confused and that she was harmless. My son was still scared, but my younger daughter was confident and full of courage. I just wanted them to be calm, and that was my big mistake. They were not supposed to be calm. And a few nights later, I would find out in the worst possible way. That night, as we were preparing dinner, a strange smell began to fill the dining room. At first, it was subtle, but it became unmistakable. A pungent, strong smell like a mixture of rotting garlic and dampness. My wife wrinkled her nose, wondering if I had left something bad in the kitchen, but I knew the source was not in our refrigerator. I decided to investigate, looking for the source of the smell. That's when I noticed the footprints. They were small, barefoot, and marked with mud that extended from the back door to the inside of the house. I began to get very nervous as I noticed how they were heading straight down the hallway that led to the bedrooms. My son was at a friend's house, but my daughter was still in her room, and that terrified me. I grabbed a metal iron I had in the garage, using it as a makeshift weapon. The smell of garlic intensified as I approached my daughter's room. I reached the door to her room and pushed it carefully, and what I saw inside chilled me. The old woman was sitting there on the edge of my daughter's bed. She was whispering something in her ear. My daughter was laying down, but awake. Her toys were on the floor as if whatever she was playing with had been interrupted. She was uncomfortable, but trying not to be afraid and handle the situation on her own. This was my fault. Fury and terror came over me in equal parts. I screamed, ordering her to get away from my daughter. The old woman looked up and stared at me. She laughed out loud and stroked my daughter's hair with her rotten, <laughs> filthy fingers. She said nothing, just stood there touching my daughter's hair. That's when I lost control. I couldn't contain my rage. I picked up the iron and slammed it against the floor hard, hoping the noise would scare her away. The old woman didn't flinch just stared at me and feigned an impressed look on her face. She was teasing me. My screams rang through the house and my wife ran into the room, encountering the scene. She screamed too, asking the old woman to let go of our daughter, that she wouldn't make things worse. Calmer, she took out her cell phone and dialed the police, demanding that someone come immediately. 
As she spoke to the operator, the old woman slowly stood up, not taking her eyes off me. Her expression had changed. She was no longer smiling. She let go of my daughter and walked past us to leave the room. I thought about grabbing her arm and pulling her out, but as soon as I got close, she held out a small knife. This was for you. Thank your wife for calling the pigs. I stopped before I touched her and let her just walk out of her house. When the police arrived, the old woman had already left. The cops tried to look for her, investigated the area and went all over the road, but found nothing. The old woman probably took another path going deeper into the forest. A few days after the incident, I tried to get back to normal. I swear I tried. I was still alert, but I needed to distract myself. I decided to go out with some friends for a bike ride, taking advantage of the cool fall air. It was getting dark, but it was still daylight, enough that the road wasn't dangerous. For a moment, I felt good, as if I could put everything that had happened behind me. I remember thinking that maybe it was all over. Maybe the old woman had gotten scared and wasn't coming back. But that tranquility didn't last long. Suddenly, a car came out of nowhere, crossing the lane and hitting us head on. Everything happened so fast that I barely had time to react. I felt the impact, the sharp pain coursing through my body as I flew through the air and landed on the asphalt. After that, I remember only for moments. Everything became confusing. Screams, sirens, the metallic taste of blood in my mouth. And after that, darkness. When I woke up in the hospital, the first thing I knew was that two of my friends had not survived. The severity of my injuries was minor compared to the head-on collision they had suffered. At the time, I thought it was all the work of a drunk driver or someone who didn't know how to drive. When I asked the police who had done it, they told me that they had found the culprit. It was an old woman. It was that old woman. In her statement, she claimed that it was an accident and that she had lost control of the vehicle. She didn't count on the fact that a film was recovered where it was clear that it was intentional. I decided to sue her to try to get some kind of justice and to this day, the lawsuit is still going on. I never understood why that old lady did everything she did to us. This story began when my boyfriend Derek and I decided to take a vacation out of town. It was a simple getaway, something we always did. We never really cared if it was summer, winter, spring, or like that time, fall, my favorite season. We took a route that almost no one knew about, one of those country roads that don't appear on digital maps. Derek was always an improviser. He liked to take odd routes and just let his instincts lead him. I wasn't too happy about it. One day we could get lost, but I trusted him. He did this with me for over five years, and we never got lost. Luckily, this route was quieter as we had a fixed destination. We had left early in the morning, with a small backpack of supplies and the idea of arriving at a rented cabin before dark. The scenery was rather dull and monotonous. Bare trees, empty roads, cloudy skies. We hadn't seen another car in hours. Derek was trying to make conversation to avoid boredom, but we both knew we were lost. The road signs, if they ever existed, had disappeared miles back. Please tell me you took the recommended route. I admit I took a slight detour, but it made sense. How could it make sense to take a detour on a straight road? It wasn't completely straight. There were times when I had to turn unnecessarily. It wasn't that unnecessary, was it? We wandered around for a while trying to find our way. We turned around and decided to go back to where Derek took the wrong turn, but to our surprise, we saw a silhouette in the road. When we saw a man standing on the side of the road asking for a ride, it was Derek who made the decision. I didn't like the idea of putting a stranger in the car, but he convinced me it would only be for a little while. The man seemed normal, a regular guy, although there was something that caught my attention. If we had driven by a few minutes before, where did he come from? Did he come out of nowhere? We didn't see him walking. I decided to stop thinking about it. Surely we weren't paying attention. 
Who knew the cost of not trusting my hunch? The man introduced himself as Michael. He said he was trying to get to a nearby town, but his car had been stranded further back. He thanked us for stopping, claiming that hardly anyone cared about others these days. Derek, ever sociable, started chatting with him. I, for one, felt uncomfortable from the start. The silence in the car became awkward after a few minutes. Derek was trying to keep the conversation going, but Michael responded with short sentences, without much interest. Then, for no apparent reason, he started asking strange questions. Why were they traveling alone on such a desolate road? Derek explained that it was an adventure, a spontaneous shortcut to make the trip more fun. Adventures sometimes end bad. <laughs> Suddenly, Michael pointed to the side of the road and asked us to stop. He said he recognized the place and that his car was nearby. Derek, without hesitation, stopped the car. I don't know how it all happened so fast. Derek didn't even have time to react. Michael pulled something out of his jacket. It was a rope, which he used to brutally choke Derek. I tried to help my boyfriend. I, I hit the man. I scratched him. I tried to stop him any way I could, but nothing worked. Derek stopped struggling. Before he died, his face looked in my direction. It looked like he was crying, like he was asking for help, or like he wanted to apologize for taking that shortcut. The car remained silent, and I stopped struggling with the man. All I could do was look into Derek's eyes. Get out of the car. He didn't give me time to think. I couldn't think. I had just watched my boyfriend die in front of me. I could only cry and obey the man. I didn't even consider whether he would kill me or not. I just listened because I couldn't think of anything else to do. He made me go around the car to the trunk, which he yanked open. There, he threw Derek's body inside like a sack of garbage. I couldn't help but throw up. The psycho laughed low, then grabbed me by the arm and shoved me back into the passenger seat. He slammed the door shut and climbed behind the wheel. The silence in the car was unbearable, but I dared not say anything. Michael drove for a while without looking back, without saying a word. Until suddenly, he spoke. Now you are thinking that this is the most painful thing that ever happened to you. You're feeling bad for your boyfriend and thinking about how to get away, aren't you? I ask you a damn question! Answer me! Yes. Well, you're making a huge mistake. I don't care about your boyfriend, that's why he died a quick death. You should worry more about what I'm going to do to you. I won't hang you, I'll kill you very Slowly, I will make sure you suffer every second. I've already done it with many women, and I'm getting better and better at it. <laughs> Why? Because fall is a great season for killing women. They all go on vacation, and there's always a good chance. I don't have any other explanation than that. Desperate, I looked around. Surely there was something I could do, something I could grab to defend myself. The keys, they were in the glove compartment. Maybe I could... Oh, and don't even think about running away. The moment you grab something, I'll kill you. If for some reason you die quickly, I'll torture your family instead of you. I have your ID right here. Nowadays, it's very easy to find people. I had no choice. The only way was to kill him. But I didn't know how. I was finished. Or so I thought. I had one last chance to escape. As fate would have it, a police car appeared on the road. We saw the blue lights in the distance, and my heart skipped a beat. It was my only chance, but how could I call for help without Michael killing me right then and there? The police car was getting closer and closer. Michael looked at me out of the corner of his eye. Don't say anything, or you know what will happen. Suddenly, the police car started to sound its siren and signaled us to slow down. The police car pulled up next to us. One of the officers rolled down the window and saluted us. Michael smiled and told them we were on a little trip and that everything was fine. The officers did not seem suspicious. Michael was convincing. They told us to be careful as they reported that a man had robbed a store in a town a few miles away. Michael's confused face was almost as big as his anger. At that moment, I understood that he was not the one who had robbed that store. A few seconds later, they decided that everything was in order and started to walk away. That was my moment. I knew I wouldn't get another chance. Without making a sound, I opened the glove compartment. 
There were the keys to the cabin. With all the strength I had left, I jammed the keys into his leg. Michael screamed, letting go of the steering wheel and putting his hands on his wound. I took advantage of that second of confusion to open the door and throw myself out of the car. Help! The policemen surrounded me, trying to calm me down, but the words would not come out of my mouth. Michael sped up the car. The cops didn't have time to get back to their car, and one of them stayed with me while the other one alerted the other patrol cars. I told them everything that had happened, how Michael had killed Derek and threatened me. They looked at each other. They were just looking for a shoplifter. They couldn't believe their ears. Hours later, I was sitting at a police station. They had taken my statement. It didn't take the cops long to discover the man's identity. Michael Fourniette was a wanted man in several regions. He was a murderer and torturer of women. The cops told me that I was lucky. After seeing my boyfriend's lifeless eyes staring at me, I wasn't so sure about that. This story is based on the crimes of Michael Fourniret, a French serial killer who terrorized the world for decades. Known as the Ogre of the Ardennes, Fourniret was responsible for a string of kidnappings and murders between 1987 and 2003. He carefully selected his victims, often targeting young women, and stalked them before committing his heinous acts. His methods were cold and calculated, luring his victims into secluded areas where they would meet a brutal end. Fornaret would typically strangle or stab his victims, sometimes using a firearm. His approach was methodical. He would dispose of the bodies in remote locations, often burying them in forests or abandoned areas to avoid detection. Despite years of evading capture, his crimes eventually caught up with him, leading to his arrest and conviction.